ever seen since desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Jim Carr of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley mm -hmm. State University Veterans History Project. Now, Mr. Carr, can you start off with some background on yourself? To begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Chicago, Illinois, in 1927, right. and uh, went all the way through high school in Chicago and Park Ridge, Illinois. Okay, so did you live in the city initially and then move out to Park yes. Ridge? Yes, okay. initially lived down in the uh, the Norwegian ghetto, where you even had a Norwegian newspaper every day. And from there, we moved on out to a, a suburban part of still in the city of Chicago, and then later out to Park Ridge, mm -hmm. which is a suburban separate city, mm -hmm. and went to high school there. All right. Uh, and what did your father do for a living? My father was a, uh, a civil engineer in the construction business. He built buildings all over Chicago. Uh, and all the Chicago area. And so was he doing that all through the 30s? Did he have regular employment then? Yes, he never lost a job. He had a job all the way through the Depression. And so we were very, very fortunate in that we had an income. Mm -hmm. Of course, that also meant that uh, cousins and uncles and so forth lived with us because we had a place for them to live mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they didn't have. Right. And so. Uh, uh, Dad tried to get into World War II, World War I, I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, as a Marine and as an artillery observer in a balloon, because uh, he had the technical background, uh, a older teenager or 20-year-old, whatever he was at the time, uh, anxious to get there, he runs up the stairs and his blood pressure was so high and his heart was beating so fast they didn't take him. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why I'm here today, because not many of those fellows came home. Right. Uh, okay. uh, now, within your family, were you, how many kids were there? Um, well, I had a younger brother who was uh, killed when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. And then I have a younger brother uh, who was nine years younger. Mm -hmm. So it was just a, in a sense, there's just the two of us. Right. Uh, but then you also had relatives coming in and out while you were a yes, kid. Yes, because dad had, dad had five sisters. Yeah, uh, all of whom raised him because he was the youngest. Mm -hmm. So he must have been a pampered kid <laughs> <laughs> with all these sisters mothering over him. Right. Uh, but uh, every one of their, uh, every one of my cousins, f male cousins, mm -hmm. all served in World War II, uh, and uncles served in World War One. All right. So it was, we've had a family of interest in uh, in things military. serving our country. Right. Okay, now, uh, do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor? Yes. And how did that come about for you? Well, in Pearl Harbor, uh, my brother was uh, uh, just five years old, and he'd heard about Jeeps, and he wanted to see a Jeep. And so it was a Sunday, and we were out for a Sunday drive. So uh, Dad said, well, why don't we go over to Fort Sheridan, north of Chicago, and see if we can see a Jeep. So we drove over to Fort Sheridan. You know, what are you coming in for? Well, son wants to see a Jeep. Okay, well, just make sure you come back out this mm -hmm. gate. Okay. We took off and we were driving through Fort Sheridan, spent the afternoon there looking at stuff. We came time to leave, we came to the gate, and the gates were closed. And we get up there, and Dad st stopped. They say, well, wh what's the problem? They opened one gate, and the guy just said, go, go, mm -hmm. go. And so we got out, and then we went over to uh, Mother's cousin up in Glencoe, and she said, isn't it terrible? Isn't it awful? Well, we didn't know what they were talking about. Didn't have a radio in our car. Mm -hmm. uh, probably wouldn't have had it on anyway because we were interested in sightseeing. Mm -hmm. So we have a very vivid memory of uh, almost being in the service right then and there. <laughs> All right. But you're only, what, 14 at that point? Yeah. Yeah. So, now, did you figure the war would be over before you had a chance to get in it? I don't think so, because we started right as soon as I got into high school. We looked for ways, what, what need we do? My first choice when I entered high school for college 
was to go to the Naval Academy mm -hmm. and take flight training. And uh, the uh, uh, tried to get into Air Force, Air Force flight training. Uh, but by the time I became old enough for that, it was turned out to be near the end of the war. But we didn't realize that at home mm -hmm. because you know there was there was good there was good censorship back then. You didn't give away all your secrets mm -hmm. like they do today, and so we didn't know all of these things that were happening. Uh, they quit taking Air Force because they had enough pilots. Mm -hmm. The Navy said, "Nope, oh, you got to have your degree before we'll talk to you." At least uh, for pilot training. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, officer candidate type of thing. Okay. Now, did you have any uh, experience with you know, flying or anything like that when you were growing up? Well, I, I joined the Civil Air Patrol. And I could do that as a teenager. As a, I think it was called cadet program. Mm -hmm. And um, we did some flying with that. One of my neighbors was one of the lieutenants. And I'd go with him as a, that's where I logged my first flight time mm -hmm. where he was the uh, pilot in command uh, of a little L4 Taylor craft mm -hmm. but uh, it was a it was a way to feel you were doing a part of it learn right. Morse code and a few things like that Sir, have a uniform drill go to places that were uh, on base they had, we had bases it's Civil Air Patrol bases scattered around Chicago Mm -hmm. And these are sort of small airstrips or just, just no, these buildings? Just, or just you flew out of existing airports. Okay. But all of our meeting places were at uh, other sites which had houses. Mm -hmm. And what was the purpose of the Civil Air Patrol at that point? What, were you, what was it for? Well, one was to have an interest in being in aviation and being into the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, the other was to fly along the coasts they flew submarine patrols mm -hmm. also f find people are lost airplanes that go down mm -hmm. or people that are just lost and then they'd go out and fly around looking for uh, to find these people mm -hmm. so like you like fly out over like michigan and yeah that kind of thing i didn't get to do all of those yeah. things but those are all of the things that were happening all right Okay, so you've, got, you've been involved, so you're, you're hoping to get an, into flying, but it's kind of not working that way. Uh, but you were still basically going to go ahead and enlist. You weren't going to wait to get drafted? Yes, yes. So in 1944, then, I took the uh, EDI test, which is an electronics skill test. And in passing that, then, made me eligible to go into the Navy as a first-class seaman instead of as an apprentice seaman. Mm -hmm. And so... We then enlisted, uh, a whole bunch of us went down. Our serial numbers were all real close together. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we were all 17. Folks had to sign off for us to, to enlist. They also said, we'll wait till graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, so in one sense, it was good because then by the time graduation, the war in Europe had ended. Uh, the war in, uh, out in the Pacific was still going on. So we... Uh, uh, got to boot camp and of course our joke is that we got to boot camp and the Japanese heard we were there and they quit mm -hmm. uh, which of course is very fallash, fallacious but uh, it was <laughs> alright now uh, when did you arrive in boot camp uh, early September of 45, 45. okay uh, and what kind of reception do you get when you arrive Oh, we're just a bunch of young kids coming into boot camp. But what do they do with you? Well, we learn not to roll dice on a, t on a blanket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we were just processed uh, just like they'd been processed for 100 years before. Okay, but for somebody not familiar with that, what actually happens to you when you get there? You're a nobody. Yeah, you're... Uh, not quite like in the Marines, but uh, it, uh, you got to learn everything. You got to learn how to dress. You got to learn how to take a shower. You got to learn how to take care of your clothes. Got to learn how to take care of yourself. Learn how to help others. All right. Uh, now, how many of you would train? Did you have a group that you trained with specifically? Uh, well, yeah, we had a, we had a uh, uh, 
we had a boot company, mm -hmm. and there was uh, like a hundred of us in that. Okay. Uh, and in our case, we we're kind of fortunate. I think three of us were the same height from the same high school. Mm -hmm. So we there were somebody you knew, uh, and uh, but we went through a regular ten week boot camp. Mm -hmm. How much emphasis was on on physical training as opposed to discipline or whatever? I don't think there was, there was no emphasis. It was just a straightforward, complete program to make you a complete sailor. Okay. So what kinds of things then are part of that? Uh, well, we had, <coughs> we had uh, weapons training, but not like you get in the Marines. Mm -hmm. It was very rudimentary weapons. In fact, our, on the rifle range, we were still using 1908 Springfield rifles. Mm -hmm. uh, we had firefighting. We had firefighting that you'd get aboard ship where you have to go down inside of a device where there's flame underneath your feet and fight that with water. Mm -hmm. We didn't have foam. Uh, we had uh, to learn how to walk, watch. We had to learn how to keep a fire going to keep the barracks warm. Um, and, and we had a march. The Navy never marched as well as the Marines. Mm -hmm. I keep saying that because during Korea, we were sent to Marine boot camp for two weeks in order to learn what the mm -hmm. real world was like. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I don't know, it's hard, you know, I've never had anybody ask, ask that question before. All right. About what, uh, what, what stands out in your mind about the, the boot camp experience? I mean, the well, I learned something about the vagaries of the real world. The Navy at that time was still 100% segregated. Mm -hmm. And there was a black boot camp and there was a white boot camp. I had never run into that. Being from Chicago, we all loved each other. We, we, we didn't have problems. Sure, we had problems, but we, we you know, you didn't have a problem to go to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. You didn't care whether they were, uh, what race they were, what ethnicity they had, whatever, because mm -hmm. we were all a big melting pot. I get into the Great Lakes and all of a sudden, bingo, here's this split. Even a fence, you couldn't even walk but, but within each other. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest surprise to me. Because mm -hmm. having been in the Boy Scouts, having been in the Civil Air Patrol, you know, I knew what military discipline was. And so the discipline mm -hmm. and the, having to get up in the morning and do calisthenics and those kinds of things. Yeah, that was just, that's just routine. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, what was the most challenging thing about the training experience? Oh, I guess the challenging thing was to identifying aircraft and identifying ships. Uh, they were only flashed on the screen for a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. And you had to tell them that that was an Iowa-class battleship, or you had to tell them that was a Fukushima battleship, or whatever the names were at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a Betty bomber, which is the name of one of the Japanese right. bombers. Okay. Now, how long does the boot camp part actually take? 10, 11 weeks. Okay. And then what did you do after you completed that? Well, then uh, they had canceled this electronics program because the war was over. Mm -hmm. But now they had to get rid of everybody. They had to discharge them all. And so, uh, I was offered the opportunity to go to dispersing clerk school to learn how to handle Navy payroll. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, they didn't tell us until we graduated, but the challenge to that was you can get discharged as soon as you've discharged everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a good incentive, make us work hard. But we, we learned to handle uh, full payroll things and then from that, uh, it was a program, it was only a three-week school program, but it was eight hours a day, solid learning the program, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a separate part of the, of the Great Lakes campus, and uh, we just put ourselves into that full, mm -hmm. full bore, and then we were assigned to a discharge unit. They had eight different discharge units, and the fellows came in. And we processed it. My responsibility as a dispersing clerk was to look at their payroll record, which came with them, mm -hmm. and see if they, uh, what money they had due to them at discharge. 
All right. Now, um, do you remember any sort of individual cases or people who, who were problems or unusual cases or things like that? Well, uh, the, uh, the case I'll never forget was a gentleman. He was a chief petty officer. He had more ribbons up his arm than you could shake a stick at, mm -hmm. but they were all red, which meant that he, he did not get top conduct awards because mm -hmm. those are gold. Most mm -hmm. chief petty officers of that time in service had gold banners. His were all red, so that meant he had a good time when mm -hmm. he was in service. His address at discharge was the same as his enlistment address in 1918. Mm -hmm. And here this fellow had been serving for, uh, no, earlier than 1908, he'd mm -hmm. been serving for 40 years, mm -hmm. and his address was still the same, probably a farm address, yep. down in Indiana. Uh, the fellows were all so happy to be home that First of all, they didn't complain about waiting. Mm -hmm. They also didn't complain about being hurried. If they came in before 2 o'clock in the morning, they were up at 6 the next morning and started processing by mm -hmm. 8. They loved it because they were getting home. Yeah. So we had probably one of the best hard-nosed jobs because everything was towards let's get you home. That would any of them argue about how much they were being paid, or is that not your area to deal with? No, you know, it, none of us got paid much. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, money wasn't the th thing. Was, if you had ten bucks, you were rich, mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, I don't, I don't remember what the thing, but well, probably a third class petty officer probably made a hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the ones above that were not a heck of a lot higher. And so the uh, one thing, I guess the records were kept pretty well. Uh, the biggest problem is a fellow that had been in, in a uh, combat situation, his payroll didn't always keep up with him. Mm -hmm. and they issued them a little eight by, I mean a little three by five card that they carried and on there they recorded when they got paid mm -hmm. so that they would know what they got paid so they could compare it. We really didn't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how long did you wind up doing that kind of work? Nine months. Mm -hmm. And then we got everybody out, so I got out just in time to start school at Michigan State. All right. So you were only in about a year then? I was in a year, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, um, what was sort of, uh, you know, kind of daily, weekly life like there? You're, you're, you're living on the Great Lakes base the whole time? Yes, okay. I never left Great Lakes, uh, and uh, there's, uh, uh, in my notes, there's a little poem about how uh, everybody recognizes that if you, if you had to stay at Great Lakes, that was the worst place to be assigned in the whole United States, whole world. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, uh, I, I start telling the story and I forget the train of thought, but your question was, what was, like living, what was what it like living yeah. on the base? Mm -hmm. uh, Great Lakes was established more as a training base, recruit training center, and a uh, transition center. You'd come in there to be assigned elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they had a place called Outgoing Unit. And these were former hangars. Great Lakes had an airport on it at one time. And these hangars were converted to barracks. Mm -hmm. 1,300 guys in each room, three-decker bunks. And uh, talk about all the different snores, <laughs> but it was you know that was that was quite a change. We had in our discharge unit we worked round the clock, so we had shifts uh, where we would work over eight hours and off eight hours. Uh, a little better than on ship, that was four mm -hmm. hours and four hours, and uh, the uh, but they gave us. Uh, ship's company pass, so we had a white pass. We had we had liberty anytime we wanted to walk out the door, as mm -hmm. long as we reported back on time. And so uh, we have eight hours off. Well, you know, you you 
didn't feel like sleeping, and so you go down the the people of the cities that lived south south of Great Lakes and north of Great Lakes opened up their beaches. Most mm -hmm. of these places had private beaches for lake forests, forest mm -hmm. hills, mm -hmm. what have you, and uh, you couldn't you couldn't as a as a walk up you couldn't go onto that beach. Mm -hmm. But if you're in uniform, hey, we're glad to help you, glad you're serving our country, you come on down Yeah, because those sort of north suburbs of Chicago have some very nice real estate, well met in Lake Forest oh, and those places. Yeah. yeah. And these were beautiful beaches, beautiful beach houses, you know, uh, changing rooms and so forth. And mm -hmm. these were made available to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so would, and would you also have sort of days off here and there? Uh, yes, we, at one time we had a, uh, we had a four section wash. Eight hours on, eight hours off, eight hours on, eight hours off, eight hours on, 56 hours off. Mm -hmm. well, that was pretty super. Well, then when the officers found out that was such a good deal, they changed it back to a conventional watch. <coughs> <Yeah. coughs> but were you able periodically to you know, get in a train and go into the city and? Oh, yes. Or hitchhike. You could mm -hmm. hitchhike back in those days. Uh, they, Great Lakes was well served. Northwestern Railway as well as the uh, 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 IC train and uh, the Milwaukee, Chicago mm -hmm. trains went through there, the express train as well as the local train. So you could get on the local and go up to Waukegan or down to Glencoe or one mm -hmm. of those places where you get on the express and go downtown. Uh, USO was marvelous. They really, really took care of the GIs in mm -hmm. Chicago. So you, what, what else would you, what would you do when you went downtown? Well, most of the time we just went downtown to see things or mm -hmm. get to the movie. The movies were very inexpensive, mm -hmm. being in uniform. Uh, USO would get us tickets for plays. Uh, they had places. That was the only time I ever bid and made seven <laughs> in Bridge <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, in the area, uh, in their uh, recreation area. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I don't know. Baseball and games, you know those? Well, of course, my folks also, my, oh yeah, my folks lived in the Chicago area, so mm -hmm. I had the opportunity then to go home. Right. But we didn't have cars. Mm -hmm. If you got there, you either had to take public transportation or hitchhike. Right. Uh, I got to the opening game at Sox Park and uh, got a great seat, compliments to the USO. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, and we took advantage of those when we, when, when we could. Mm -hmm. Sort of as, as kind of a, a Chicago boy or whatever, you had some idea of where to go and how to sure. do it and that kind of thing. All right. Uh, so, I mean, on the whole, not too bad in existence, it sounds like. No, other than uh, I had planned to be at college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, did you have uh, other kinds of duties besides just uh, doing your job? I mean, I think there was something you had in, in your written memoir about having to do fire watch at night, or was that just when you were in boot camp? I think that was in boot camp uh, because we we worked so many hours mm -hmm. in this discharge thing that and the trains came in one after the other. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of guys, you know, there was a lot of fellows in service, and they were right. trying to get them all out and get them home. And so uh, we didn't have time to walk fire watch mm -hmm. when we were doing that. But we did during, during boot camp and during training when I was going through the training program and when I was in the outgoing unit. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there was times when temperatures were below zero and you couldn't find enough clothes to put on. Because <laughs> you had to stand outside and go from oh, yeah. Yeah, building to building and that kind of sure. thing. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, so back then, all of these places were individually heated, mm -hmm. all these buildings individually heated. Uh, some of them with coal, which is where you get the word fire watch. Some of them with oil, which maybe was as dangerous as cooking with, eating it with coal. All right. Uh, so basically you, you, you do this for about a year and then you get out, you're able to kind of go off to college. Yeah. All right. But I did enlist in the, in, uh, in the uh, um, reserves, mm -hmm. Navy reserves. And this initially was in the... Uh, there was some title for it, but anyway, you didn't go to meetings. You mm -hmm. were just on the books. Yeah, sort of those inactive reserve. Inactive yeah. reserve. Well, then I got to Michigan State, and they were organizing a, uh, or had a organized company, 
So I went down, see about that. It was a way to get a couple of bucks to help mm -hmm. get me through school, because even though I had the GI Bill, you still had to have a few dollars. Mm -hmm. And I guess only got like $45 every three months, but it helped. Mm -hmm. And uh, that unit was full, and they were organized in a second unit. So I got into that unit and progressed from downtown uh, Lansing out to their reserve center that they still have out just up the edge of town. And uh, uh, because I could type, uh, I could work any hours I wanted to work. I didn't mm -hmm. have to always go Monday night or mm -hmm. Saturday night or whatever. And uh, so I could work it in between my classes when I had space off on class. I could uh, take the bus down to, from campus to the reserve center. Okay. Now, was the unit uh, there in, in Lansing, was that a particular type of unit? They just call it an organized surface unit. It okay. was just whatever thing. Well, then they formed a CB unit. Mm -hmm. And because I was in civil engineering, I thought, well, hey, this is the thing to do. I did that, and on that basis, then I was able to earn a uh, second-class rating, which at the time I didn't realize what a good deal that was until I got called active duty. Right. And did you get specialized training as part of this, or any kind of, did you spend a couple of weeks here and there? Yes, yeah. we had to uh, go out and I had one, one of my uh, assignments was uh, two weeks with the Naval Intelligence in downtown Chicago. I had to get a secret rating to go there. Uh, every person's name I put on that little sheet of paper I filled out was mm -hmm. contacted within 24 hours. All of them contacted before I got to tell them I'd given their name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, then this of course gave me the right to have a key, if you will, in the naval intelligence files. And I was the file clerk. Mm -hmm. We had the intelligence people that reviewed newspapers and what have you. And I had to file all the stuff that they had uh, with under the names of the people that they were watching. Now yeah. this is sort of Cold War era now. And are you yeah. wor were worrying about communists and things like that, or spies, or? Well, uh, you know, I, I was too low on the mm -hmm on the totem pole to know what they were looking for other than that they sure had a lot of people who had a lot of aliases mm -hmm. uh, which was a something brand new to this little uh, suburban high school kid. All right. At a little bit different angle at this point, uh, you're, you're from Chicago area. How did you wind up going to Michigan State? Michigan State, uh, I was looking for a school that was civil engineering okay. and I could get a job afterwards. Mm -hmm. My next door neighbor was a civil engineer, very successful, had a big firm in downtown Chicago. So I asked him, mm -hmm. you know, what, what school? My, my dad came up from the school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to college except for business courses. So I asked uh, Art, mm -hmm. where should I go to school? Uh, Art Consor, Consor Townsend was the name of their firm. And he said, well, he says, I would never hesitate to hire a graduate of Michigan State. And since he was an alumni of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. I took that to be really a strong recommendation. All right. And he even offered to me to uh, come up and live in his summer home over the summer so I could make application from that address so I could be a, a residence. To, well, I didn't do that. And as a GI, that was not a problem mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, but uh, he was really, he really pushed Michigan State. Okay. Well, if he felt that way, anybody else that would hire me ought to feel the same way. So that was my number one school. All right. Now, are you, you're, were you still in school at the point when the Korean conflict started up? No, I was, I, I was graduating first of June. Mm -hmm. Wife and I talked about, here I'm in the reserve, should I make application for a, a CB? commission mm -hmm. and we decided no let's not your enlistment's expiring uh, at the end of August uh, let's just let it expire mm -hmm. and uh, so that was our decision mm -hmm. not, not to make application well then the 25th of June uh, the North Koreans invaded uh, 27th of July of 1950 Harry Truman as president extended all our enlistments by one year. And uh, then in August, uh, yeah, in, 
about the middle of August, mm -hmm. got word to report to active duty on the 7th of September. We were shipping out. Wife and I had just, my fiance and I mm -hmm. had just picked up our invitations for a wedding to get married on September 9th. Oh. And so, uh, fire drill time, and we changed our anniversary, our, our wedding date mm -hmm. to August 23rd, and made it happen. And everybody got there, probably because Jim was being drafted, mm -hmm. so to speak. And um, uh, we went, uh, so we changed our wedding day. We had to take black ink and change the, we didn't have time to print new mm -hmm. forms. You don't, can't print them like you right. can today. Right. You know, you had to go through a print shop. So we just took the pen and changed the dates on the invitations. And uh, of course, this got a lot of my mother's friends uh, then started to count on their fingers as to how long it was before we would have our first child. Mm -hmm. And we disappointed them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, it made for quite a change. But that's when I found out how good that achieving a second class petty officer rating was. My wife was given transportation to wherever I was based, mm -hmm. stateside, that mm -hmm. is. And I was higher on a list when I made application for married housing on, on the base, and which we were able to achieve. Wife and I, our first home was a Quonset hut, 20 by 20 Quonset hut. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the beginning of our marriage was a little different, but not, not that different from the fellows during World War II. Went Certainly. Through. All right. So where do, they, where do you report to first when you're called up? We were called up. We reported to the Naval Reserve Center, and then we went out to the uh, uh, Pier Marquette Railroad Station in, in Lansing and got on the regular train that was coming through, went down to Fort Wayne, one of the oldest forts in the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, stayed overnight there, and then we were put on a train to, sh to Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of us got on the train to Great Lakes, because some of the guys, because they were uh, loose from home or away from whatever, they didn't make it back to Fort Wayne. <laughs> I don't know what happened to them, mm -hmm. but uh, because it was more than just the Seabees that were called up. Truman did things a little differently than they are doing it today. Today, our fellows are getting called up as a unit, mm -hmm. and they're serving as a unit, people that they trained with. Uh, the decisions during Korea were, we're gonna pick them up from all over so it doesn't look so bad. Mm -hmm. We're not getting these big groups leaving. Of course, we had quite a picture in the paper, so I don't know how they won on that, but. No. Uh, you were a big group, but so, not all so from the we same didn't town. So we didn't end up to serve. There were only two fellows in my CB unit that I had been with in the CB unit, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Lansing CB unit. The, the rest of them went to different places. So we didn't get to serve together, mm -hmm. was, which was kind of too bad, because we you build up a com com sure. camaraderie with right. people, and uh, you like to work with them. Yeah, at that point, they were filling out the ranks of a lot of units that were not at full strength you know, yes. after the war. They had gotten down to kind of skeleton size, and now they had to rebuild around those cadres, too as well as create new units. If I had been called up two weeks earlier, I would have been on the Inchon invasion, mm -hmm. and which probably would have meant that I would have been in a group that moved on up to the Yalu River that got overrun by the Chinese. And what I would have gone through with all of that, you know, uh, fortunately doesn't cause any sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it gives you pause for thought at times about what, how, how the good Lord works in various ways and, how he helped me. Right, now when you went down to Great Lakes, was that just for, for processing or did you stay yes. there a while? I didn't know that, we were there just, ended up being there just one weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, our wives came down, then they turned out and gave us liberty. And so the wives came down at a car full. Well then when you added four or five fellas to that, we had a real <laughs> car full going back to, Grand, back to Lansing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then had to go back Sunday night. Uh, then it was just a day or two later that we went by troop train. In this, in this case, the entire train was troops. Mm -hmm. It was a, truly a troop train. 
left from the Chicago, Chicago Northwestern Station and took us three days to get to California and then out to the CV, uh, CV base at Port Wainimi. So what do you remember about the train trip? It was long. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. Woke up at dawn. We were going through a, one of these canyons out in Colorado and the sun hitting the sides, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a layover at Salt Lake City. We got to go up to the, over to see the uh, Mormon temple mm -hmm. uh, and the tabernacle. Uh, that's about it, other than... Yeah, because I guess because it's sort of late summer, early fall, so the weather's good and you're not getting snowed in the passes or things like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then where do you wind up in California? At Port Wainimi, Oxnard, California. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's also a naval air base there that they did training. Uh, Point Magoo Naval Air Station. Uh, but the, it was a CB embarkation point for World War II it is still active. It's still an active base today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you got there, then uh, what happened to you? Um, well, I didn't find out until I got a copy of my service jacket after I got out of service. But I was at that time assigned to Naval Mobile Construction Battalion Three, mm -hmm. which hadn't even been formed yet, and uh, so we were in the process of getting that group together in order to be a complete thousand man, and back then it was all men, mm -hmm. thousand man battalion. And we, uh, uh, we had to build some of our own housing. They had to put up tent cities and so forth right there you know, to handle all the extra people. Uh, got to participate in the commissioning of that assignment of an officer. I happened to be in the uh, um, uh, color guard and so my picture ended up being in the Los Angeles Times uh, because mm -hmm. of the uh, change of command is always a big deal in the Navy and uh, when we were you know assigned all of our people and getting ready to to ship out and but we didn't ship out until I think I said I went went, went in in September we didn't ship out until the first week or two of, of January. Okay. So what did you do in between? Well, besides, uh, I got an assignment to the uh, public works group that m runs the base. So I got to work on roads and sewers and buildings and so forth. My civil engineering work, mm -hmm. which is kind of super. Uh, I think I could have gained more there, but... I wasn't that happy with being in service, being called back in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by Harry. Uh, <laughs> and some of the fellows were pretty upset, a lot more upset than I was. Yeah. What kind of mix of people was in that unit in terms of age or experience or background? There was uh, probably 60%, probably maybe 70% World War II vets mm -hmm. or people of that age. The rest were younger who had joined into these reserve units. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like the youngest of the old guys? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, did you get any additional training uh, before you, you shipped out? Well, the, the biggest training we had was that the Marines found out, uh, the military found out, that if you don't get good basic training, you're going to be killed. And I heard said that the Marines had more Marine, six weeks after the Korean invasion, they had more Marines in Korea than there were in the Marine Corps before June 25th. Mm -hmm. And they had terrible casualties. A lot of casualties also, CV units and whatever. And so they said, okay, you guys all got to go back to boot camp. So they sent us down to two weeks boot camp at the Marine base. And so we were assigned down to uh, the uh, recruit training, San Diego. Mm -hmm. We stayed at the uh, uh, amphibious uh, uh, base, the place where the SEALs train. Mm -hmm. So we were right with them, living in one of their barracks. Every morning we took a landing craft across San Diego Bay to get over to 
San Diego Naval Reserve Training, uh, Recruit Training, mm -hmm. and we went through the 12 weeks of Marine Boots in two weeks. What they spent a day on, we spent an hour on. We hit every weapon that they used, mm -hmm. but we spent an hour on a weapon. We learned to take the weapon apart, mm -hmm. but not in the dark. Uh, and so, but we learn more about staying alive. We learn more about marching. We learn more about uh, being a good soldier than we'd ever learned in 12 weeks of Navy boot camp. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of a lot of strong feelings for my Marine Corps friends. Uh, now, what do they think of, of your two-week program? If you tell them about that, do they say, ah, well, you know, that was the, the light version? We tried hard to train you guys, mm -hmm. but uh, you're still Navy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But they, they give you at least that much before anything else. Okay, so you do that for, what, a two-week period? Just a two-week period. Okay, and then you go back to Winnie again. And then... I had some leave time coming, so I, I applied for leave and they granted it to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they granted it to me, because when, I, when we got back, uh, where have you been? We're getting ready to ship out, mm -hmm. type of thing. But wife and I had a marvelous trip through uh, Northern California and up into Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we took advantage of where we probably wouldn't go back, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't live there again. Yep. All right, uh, so now you ship out, uh, where do they ship you to? Well, that was when we shipped up to Am uh, Aleutian Islands, mm -hmm. up to Amchitka. It was a secret project. We were not told we were going there. We guessed that we were. We came up with all kinds of little uh, things to put in our letters that would let our family know where we were without saying it, where mm -hmm. we were. And. Uh, so we went up to the Aleutian Islands on a secret project for the Atomic Energy C Commission to do underground nuclear testing in basalt rock, which had never been done. Okay. Now, before we kind of get into that, uh, tell us about the, the trip up there. How did they get you up to Amchitka? Well, we, we went up with three separate groups. Like I mentioned earlier, we had a thousand members of our battalion. But Amchika had not been occupied by a thousand people since World War II. Mm -hmm. All they had out there was a weather base, and they were based in the hangar, and they were living in the officers' quarters. You know, they, they, they were in great shape, but they didn't have room for a thousand people. And so, uh, two dozen of our people were flown up there. Mm -hmm. And then, a couple of weeks later, about a about hundred of us left on a... Uh, an attack cargo ship and that ship had just returned from taking people off Korea at Busan. Mm -hmm. It was not the cleanest vessel but it was very seaworthy and it carried a lot of stuff and we brought a whole ship full of construction equipment. Mm -hmm. Some of it so heavy that to, to lower it off the ship, they'd have to put a, raise up a heavy device and s put it on the port side, uh, on the starboard side, mm -hmm. and then raise up the other one so they could lower it on the s port side without the ship tripping. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, you know, all, all the construction equipment to build roads and what have you, uh, we, we took with us. So the, the challenge to us hundred then was to get housing put together mm -hmm. for the thousand. So we spent our next couple of three weeks up there getting things fixed. Right. Uh, but what was the voyage up there like? Was that memorable or was that quiet? Oh, it, no, it was, uh, we had some good weather. We had times when, we had one time I think I went down in the boiler room. I couldn't sleep because it was going so bad and my stomach was going right with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I went down in the boiler room because down, down below the ship doesn't move as much. Mm -hmm except you looked at the inclinometer and it's going all the way up to 30, 30 40 degree uh, roll <laughs> each way. Uh, so you knew it was happening, uh, but uh, never any danger. Mm -hmm. It was just heavy seas, not, nothing, probably nothing heavier than what we had when we'd been out in a little rowboat out uh, 
off St. Ignace or out mm -hmm. in the middle of some Lake Michigan when the winds kick up. That was also dark most of the time? No, let's see, we, we left in January and so we left when we got up there, let's see, but Amchitka is the Florida of the Aleutian chain. Mm. It is the southernmost island of the Aleutians. It's not much farther north than maybe Vancouver. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you still have night and day all year. You still had night and day. Also, uh, the strange thing was aboard ship, the, the compass heading was virtually straight west. And here we left from uh, Southern California. Mm -hmm. And we had, of course, there's a magnetic heading, which you have to acknowledge when you're farther west, magnetic heading might be 15 or 20 degrees different mm -hmm. than north. But uh, uh, we got to the Aleutians. The Aleutians are known for their fantastic weather. And it's, it's nice that the big hangar has a big sign, welcome to Mchitka, the Florida, the Aleutian chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is snowing, of course. But there's no permanent frost. Mm -hmm. it, it's far enough south, and the Japanese current comes by so that it forms this fog. You've heard of, you know, it, 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 fog will never exist in a wind of more than 10, 15 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Well, we had solid fog at 30 knot winds <laughs> because the so, this fog is being formed as fast as it gets blown away. Because mm -hmm. you have the warmer water is around you and then it hits well, the colder the Bering air. Bering Sea on one side is yeah. cold and, yeah. and the Japanese current in the Pacific Ocean is warm. All yeah. right, uh, so when you got there, what did it in look like or what facilities were there? Oh, I was quite surprised. There was two, th two 8,000 foot runways, one 4,000 foot runway, which had been basically destroyed, so it couldn't be used. They were going to destroy the others, but fortunately, fortunately they did not. Mm -hmm. We had a big hangar for, to handle aircraft, and we could put our vehicles inside to be warm when necessary. Uh, and a little bit of housing. The boiler plant was still there, so they could still cook up stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it was pretty much an abandoned island. The Quonset huts were abandoned Quonset huts, and nobody had taken care of them for four years. Uh, and so th things were not conducive to uh, having nice housing. Okay. So what kinds of do work did you have to do when you first got there then? Well, our first work then was to convert warehouses to barracks. Mm -hmm. We didn't, tr we didn't try to build new stuff. We just tried to do with what we could do. And of course, that's what the CVs are for, you know, to make things happen, mm -hmm. not to make it the best. And uh, so we converted a number of warehouses into uh, barracks. Uh, this did not mean that they had running water or toilets, but they did have electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, we built... Uh, uh, eight hole chick sails at different spots. And then uh, eventually we got some running water into a uh, 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 shower place so we could wash and, and have heated water. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a joy. Otherwise you had to go all the way up to the hangar. Every, everybody, no matter where you were, you had to go to the hangar, which could be a half mile away. And very few vehicles, most of it was walking. Mm -hmm. And what were the weather conditions like? The coldest temperature we ever saw was 28 one morning, mm -hmm. and uh, that was gone by daytime. We never had snow last more than a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but the change is by how high, how high are you above the water? The living area of, of Amchitka is 200 feet above the uh, ocean, and no permafrost there, but no trees. Mm -hmm. The northern end of the island at 700 feet, there was snow year round. So the, the difference, the, every 100 foot of elevation was another climate. And when we started doing our program towards the testing, we were moving up to the northern end of the island and getting into you know, more difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. All right, now, uh, did they eventually move the, the whole battalion up there? Or was it only oh, a yes. part? Okay. All the rest of them came up, and they came up and, uh, Instead of, uh, they came up in a victory ship, which are much nicer. And uh, they, uh, 
I know we got a kick out of it because they came, they arrived, and they had um, they had a thousand sea bags and one Plymouth sedan, so that the commander could have a car. <laughs> he couldn't drive it very far. Mm -hmm. He couldn't. He didn't dare take it out to where we had to work because right. we had trouble with four-wheel drive vehicles getting down the roads that hadn't been, again, the roads hadn't been maintained for four years. Now, were these just tracks, basically? Yeah. Yeah, you weren't, didn't have paved roads or things oh, like no. that. Oh, no. Only, well, there were paved roads around the hangar, mm -hmm. and of course, paved, paved runway. runways. Yeah. But uh, most, of the, most of the paved roads were gravel. Okay. Uh, I recall from your written memoir, you mentioned, okay, the, the, the thousand men come in, the, the thousand sea bags, the sedan. What did they not bring with them? Well, they, they, they brought the flu bug with them, for one thing. <laughs> what did they not bring? Well, I don't know what they didn't. Uh, they, food? We, we were pretty well equipped. We did had, they have food for them? Oh, yeah. Because I think in the memoir it suggested they hadn't brought up food for them. And well, I, I, I don't remember now what I wrote about that, mm -hmm. but the, uh, uh, we were fortunate to be able to have a regular galley. Mm-hmm. Now, it didn't always operate. There were times when they first arrived, we all got sea rations. Mm -hmm. And we had some of the warehouses we kept as warehouses and filled them up with sea rations. Mm -hmm. um, and some of which were still dated from World War II, but they still tasted good. Mm -hmm. As good as a sea ration tastes. Uh, the, uh, our big food problem was the people that didn't work right near the kitchen. So the big meal was at noon, and where were we at noon? We were half an hour up the island, up to our knees in mess, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, how do, how do, typical thing, you know, you're up your knees in the swamp, what's your chore? Your chore is to drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. Well, we were trying to drain the swamp, and they were eating a good meal someplace, and we got a cold sandwich. Mm -hmm. Then we come back for dinner, and all I had for dinner were cold sandwiches. And so uh, it, that wasn't because they didn't have the food there. Mm -hmm. It's just that the logistics of getting the food to whomever should have it didn't yeah. always work out. Now, while you were up there, uh, you kept a diary. Uh, why did you do that at that time? Well, I, I guess I felt that it was a secret project. We can't write home about it. If we did, it'd just be censored. So if I keep a diary, maybe I can get the diary home. And I was always conscious of secrecy and didn't talk about these things. Uh, but I put things in the diary then that, uh, as to jog your memory. Mm -hmm. And to keep track, who sent me letters? You probably noticed that. that yep. It's got letters from so and so and so and so. That got me to write the letter back. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess the other thing that stands out a lot in, in the diaries, in, in part, is you're, you're kind of keep track of what you got to eat. Yeah. So when you did get those dinners and so forth, we usually we often knew what those were and how good they were. Well, you see, our our, our family has always enjoyed good meals, mm -hmm. and we still enjoy good meals. Uh, and our our kids uh, are are bringing their families up the same way mm -hmm. that they enjoy good meals. And so uh, my mother always would refer to a party as what they had to eat. Mm -hmm. And I was carrying through that legacy of my mother, I guess. All right. So once that you got the base facilities kind of set up and organized and so forth, and the full battalion is out there, uh, now what did your main duties consist of? What were you doing day to day? Well, then, then we put on our real surveyor hats. Uh, I was in this one survey crew. We had, two, we had three survey crews working. And we were out laying out the ground zero line, starting from ground zero out uh, well, about three miles. And this had to be established, it had to be witnessed, it had to be tied to a triangulation system because we were told that when they did the test, whatever we'd put down there was gonna be destroyed, but you have to be able to put it back. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we did, we had to have witnessed in a way, witnessed maybe a mile away, and then they have to work the thing back. You have to do probably more work to reestablish it than we had to do to establish it in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had to take elevations of all these areas uh, around where 
these blasts were going to occur. And it was two or three different spots that they'd selected. All right. So basically you were kind of laying out physically what the topography of the island what, was what, and yeah. so forth so that when an explosion happened you would know what damage yep. it actually well, did. What, what's the topography? Also we laid out the buildings that they were going to build mm -hmm. of different types of construction to see how it stood up to what happened. Mm -hmm. And so we had to locate those buildings and have that established so that they could measure back in and say, well, here's where the building used to be and what mm -hmm. happened. It moved a foot or it's gone completely. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know what was going to happen. Okay. What were some of the biggest challenges of doing that kind of work? Biggest challenges there was the weather. Uh, the wind never stops. In, in surveying, you always look at the point that, well, you know, if it's too windy, we're not going to survey because the, the equipment vibrates. You try to look through the telescope and everything is bouncing around. But we had to work anyway. Mm -hmm. And so you got to where you could get to where you could put your finger against the telescope just enough to stop the vibration, but not enough to change settings. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, the, uh, the Aleutian Islands are all tundra, grasses that have grown up and f go down, mm -hmm. grow up and go down, and just forms a mattress. You walk and it's a sponge. Mm -hmm. How do you set up a transit or a level for survey purposes on a mattress? Mm -hmm. And then walk around on that mattress and have the gun, the, the instrument stay uh, proper. Uh, you'd get a thing is set up, you couldn't move. You had to stay in the same spot that you were in because you'd changed the, if you moved over to here, you would change where the instrument was pointing. Now, uh, what size was the, was the team you were with? How many men were in it? Well, we got in one Dodge truck, mm -hmm. a Dodge carry-all truck. Yeah. So uh, five or six of us. Okay. Uh, and what sort of people were they? Super people. Uh, from all over the United States, uh, from Washington, uh, California, Michigan, uh, Kansas, uh, and we had from a senior seaman to surveyors third class, second class, first class, mm -hmm. and a chief surveyor. Uh, and we ran, our, our single group would run two instruments at, at once. Two of us were instrument men. Mm -hmm. And we'd be running both at the same time. And we would alternate shots, set up our our, our books, our record books, such that we could, uh, for speed, we mm -hmm. could alternate shots and cover an area faster. So you did that faster than the other teams did? No. Okay, so they also would have two instrument guys? And sure. Yeah, they do that. But and uh, you'd get, and of course we always got called out for some little assignment, say, mm -hmm. well, will you go down and check and make sure what the elevation of the tide gauge is? And uh, uh, who's reading the tide gauge? We just got a note from central headquarters that there was an earthquake somewhere and we're supposed to report the changes in the tide gauge. We mm -hmm. didn't even know we had a tide gauge <laughs> <laughs> or that that was our responsibility. All right. Uh, now, um, you mentioned, you talked a little bit here about sort of the, the daily life, the, the feeding schedule and that kind of thing. Uh, what could you do when you were off duty? You're stuck on this island out in the Aleutians. What was there to do? Not much. Uh, we'd go out and we'd hike. We'd go and look around because again we we're at a place we probably would never be again mm -hmm. I've often wanted to go back but never have uh, we would we would hike to the Pacific Ocean side or we'd hike to the Bering Sea side you'd see the uh, sea otter uh, the walrus mm -hmm. whatever out there honking away uh, and climb down to get our hands wet because to say we'd been in the Pacific or mm -hmm. been in the Bering Sea, uh, it, the coast was a lot like the Monterey coast. Everything is straight down to the ocean mm -hmm. from 100 feet up or so. Uh, quite an area of eagles, so we'd observe the eagles' nests. And there was no trees, so the eagle was nesting on a pinnacle of stone off to the mm -hmm. side. We had a feel of safety. 
Right. Uh, blue fox, we observed them. Right. And uh, did the military provide anything for you? Do they have movies or anything else oh, like that? Oh, yeah. I had movies every night. Most of them were B movies, mm -hmm. <laughs> left over from somewhere. Uh, and uh, we, uh, but for recreation, there, there wasn't much. I don't, I don't remember any, you know, basketball games or football or any of that going on or baseball. Yeah. About how long were you on Amchitka? We were there from January till June. Okay. So, but again, I, I mentioned earlier, we, it was canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I didn't mention, I might have said that earlier okay. to you without, before we were yeah. out. But we all, we got word in May that we were being canceled and we were going back. I think it's because the equipment that we had to do some of the preliminary testing wasn't strong enough or wasn't big enough. It was portable equipment instead of permanent equipment. You couldn't drill a hole in basalt. You just couldn't mm -hmm. get, we just couldn't get through it. And so I think they, we got enough set up that they could proceed, but proceed after uh, other things were done. Mm -hmm. We had people come up from uh, Antarctica. We have people coming from uh, Atomic Energy Commission met with us on all of this. We never knew what their conclusions were other than, mm -hmm. well, I guess you guys go home. Uh, but you Google Amchitka mm -hmm. and you find out more than you ever want to know. One of which is in the 70s, they actually did the tests mm -hmm. and followed through with what we got started on. All right. Uh, now you mentioned you had some kind of unusual people coming up um, to the Island and so forth. Uh, did you get to spend some time with these people? And yes, because they they were field people. Mm -hmm. They weren't people that sat up in an office in a conference room. These were people that were out there in the mud with us uh, to, to make decisions based on what they're actually seeing. Mm -hmm. And so we had people that had been, uh, well, this one fellow had been with Richard Byrd down in Antarctica, mm -hmm. uh, which was fascinating to yeah. be able to talk to him. And he was dumbfounded that we didn't have permafrost. He thought that all of Alaska was permafrost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the atomic energy people, they're all, they're all pretty close mouthed as to mm -hmm. what they're gonna talk about because their only history to talk about would be the stuff that you can't talk about. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but they gave us counsel and guidance and we gave them counsel and guidance mm -hmm. based upon the real world, world that we were in. Now, did you ever get uh, a any kind of brass or high-ranking types come out? Yeah, we had a we had a B-17 come in that had picture windows. Uh, been modified to handle some guy a star right up on the is that means he'd be a rear admiral. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, came in. We never saw them, other than maybe if we happened to be up there and see him get out of the plane. Mm -hmm. Another time a B-25 Billy Mitchell came in. That also had picture windows built in. <laughs> so. So generals kind of came, or admirals kind of came out to take a look at things once in a while. Yeah. But it did, didn't stay long? No. It, you, in the illusions, you've got to take care, advantage of the weather that you have. Mm -hmm. So you'd come in, the weather's good, get your business done, get out before the weather gets bad, because you might be there two more days. Because you can't fly out. And this affected mail. Mm -hmm. We'd get, we'd get mails in bits and, bits and pieces because a plane, you'd hear the plane, but you'd never see it. And it'd be another day or two mm -hmm. days before it'd come back. Now, were you able to kind of keep track of events elsewhere pretty well? I mean, did you know what was going on either in the Korean War or back home or? Mostly that what we knew about was what the f f wife or others sent us. We didn't have armed forces radio up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had one radio we could pick up uh, Clint, Texas, which is uh, one of these big million watt mm -hmm. TV stations that does nothing but play Texas music uh, <laughs> and didn't give us any news. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you could only get it at certain times of the day or night when the weather was just right. So we never really had communication with, with the rest of the world. Uh, we did hear over one of these stations, when had a fire in 1951, and they had a fire in the, sh in the Lansing uh, office building, state office mm -hmm. building burned. Uh, 
except it came over our report as the capital. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't until a week later when I got a letter from home or clippings. Mm -hmm. so, no, we didn't really know what was going on. We didn't know what was going on in Korea until we got home. Okay. Now, what was your wife doing while you were uh, out in Alaska? Well, she went back to Lansing. She left, closed out our housing. Of course, she, once I left, she didn't have housing. Mm -hmm. She had to be out within the next number of days uh, and was on her own then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she, uh, her dad came out and uh, the two of them drove back uh, to, uh, to Lansing. And she went back to work with the, uh, uh, I'm trying to, I can't remember exactly who she worked for at the time, Lansing mm -hmm. Letter Service. Mm -hmm. or, uh, at one time she also worked for the State Crippled Children's Commission. They don't call it that anymore, but. All right. Okay. Are there um, particular uh, people that, that you knew in Alaska there I work with that kind of stand out in your mind, kind of good, bad, ugly, whatever? Well, you know, you, there's not much memories of the, of the difficulties. They show up in my diary, mm -hmm. but uh, the ones that you remember are the ones that you made some point to contact. Mm -hmm. uh, the officer in charge of our uh, uh, headquarters unit uh, lived in California upon retirement. I talked with him. I don't know if I met with him or not. Uh, the uh, one of the young surveyors that was with us uh, just about the time that we were ready to, sh well, we were still up there. He got a call that his commission came or his training came through. And he was being assigned to go to Naval Training Center. And so we still correspond with him and his wife. Uh, another fellow, one of the equipment operators uh, that uh, made all these things work. We maintained correspondence until he died. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had correspondence with our former legal officer, uh, Mike Forbes of the Forbes Magazine people. Mm -hmm. Uh, he stayed in the Navy for quite a few years, uh, and he's corresponded. What kind of stuff did he have to deal with? I think you've got, you, you mentioned uh, off camera something about a, a court martial, somebody uh, brewing something, should yeah. have been, or? It was, it, it was an interesting point where I wasn't involved in this, but the, the yeoman, the stenographer, secretary, that worked for the legal officer, had to prepare a report about this court-martial. Well, he got this thing all put up and typed together. He didn't have anybody to proofread it. Well, he knew that I had a college education, mm -hmm. and so he asked me to proofread it. So I got to read about this fellow who was accused of stealing some strawberries, putting it under his bed, and brewing up some strawberry mash uh, to get the alcohol out of it. Mm -hmm. And through the efforts of the, well, I don't know if it was the efforts of the legal officer, but the kid got off. He did <laughs> not get court-martial. <laughs> and this is where uh, Ensign Forbes, who was our legal officer, uh, got in trouble with the lieutenant commander, or the commander of our base, because the commander was positively, absolutely certain the kid was at fault, and therefore mm -hmm. he should be court-martialed, and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so uh, that was a little insight to something that goes on that you wouldn't normally even hear about mm -hmm. unless you happen to be in the same barracks. I wasn't, and I was not in the same barracks. I, I didn't know the individual that was, was being uh, accused of this. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what, what's morale like if you're out, out there in this, this island in the Aleutians with all these guys? And oh, the morale would go up and down, you know, it, probably a lot with the weather. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can, it, you can feel awfully miserable when the wind sto never stops blowing and it's always whistling and there's plenty of cracks in the warehouse that you live in as a barracks. Uh, the, uh, um, they'd sell beer about once a week mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the chaplain would see that paperback books got shipped up, they'd come in a great big box no paperback books that he distributed around. Mm -hmm. So the guys have something to read. Uh, we had a chaplain. 
our, our instance, it was a Catholic chaplain, but he put on Protestant services. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the uh, wasn't much to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like like I said earlier. We you know we we'd go out and we'd hike. Uh, here we're hiking all day long in our job, and then when it's the day off, mm -hmm. we go out and we do some more. But you know, you don't want to sit around a hangar. Mm -hmm. I remember trying to use some of my civil engineering. We measured up the truss in the in the hangar so we could calculate the loads that that truss would support. Just something, mm -hmm. just something to do. Something wasn't something we had to do. Okay. Now, what sort of were the the terms of, of your enlistment? I mean, when they uh, you left in, in June, was that going to be pretty much it for you in the Navy, or how did that work? Well, I, when, I, when I signed up, I signed up for four years. Mm -hmm. Very typical today, some are four, some are six, some mm -hmm. are eight. Mine was for four. That would have expired on a, August of 50. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry extended that to August of 51. He, he, he extended only one year. Mm -hmm. He did not do like we did during World War II, where you, you served until the war was over. Right. Some such yeah, title for the rate. duration. Yeah, duration. This was not that, and so when that one year was up, I was re I, I either had to re-enlist, uh, or, or I was out. Now, had you at some point uh, put in to get officer training? Yeah, I decided to do that. I, now, I, now <laughs> we, wife and I decided not to, but then when mm -hmm. I got called to active duty and I was there, I thought, well, gee, maybe I should. So I went through the whole process, mm -hmm. and uh, about one month before my discharge was scheduled, I got word that the commission came through, uh, or a commission would mm -hmm. come through if I accepted. Yeah. And so uh, wife and I had that same discussion again and came up with the same conclusion, and no, we will not. And uh, whether that was a good decision or not, uh, we're extremely happy with what we've done with our life, so it was mm -hmm. a good decision. Uh, and so we turned that down, so come the 26th of August, uh, I got my walking papers, mm -hmm. got another discharge. Well, I have two discharges. <laughs> okay. Now, how did they get you uh, back from Amchitka? You were, oh, we came, we came home in a victory ship. Uh, and. Uh, which uh, again we had to load all this equipment back on it. A victory, uh, well, to the people it served, and it means something more than what I could say. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, uh, we all came back. The whole thousand came mm -hmm. back together uh, on one ship. Not like when we went up. When we went up in three different contingents. But we were going back to an established base, mm -hmm. a little different than when we yep. initially went out. Uh, and so we again had you know, six or seven days uh, uh, across the Pacific, going mm -hmm. eastbound instead of westbound. It was kind of nice because the, the captain would give us the latitude and longitude each day so we could have a, a record of where we were. Mm -hmm. We never became members of uh, of the uh, uh, Nautilus Society, whatever they call it, for crossing the international date line, because the, the international date line kicks around, and so the, the entire Aleutian chain mm -hmm. is east yeah. of the date line, even though it's across. We were across the 180th parallel. Right. We were over to we were over to west declinations instead mm -hmm. of east, but we didn't become members of the uh, You didn't, didn't join Neptune. that particular club, right? No. All right. Uh, so you get back, and then you're discharged pretty quickly after that. Um, so did you go find yourself a job as a civil engineer? What did you do? Well, we had, we had some offers out in California. There was some really pretty financially for some kind of nice offers. But we spent roughly a year, plus and minus, with time gone mm -hmm. in California. And we decided we loved our Michigan climate. Mm -hmm. We loved Michigan. We loved our families who was still here in Michigan. And so we said, no, we'll, we'll come back here. And uh, uh, the job that I had as a bridge engineer designer 
uh, bridge design engineer, mm -hmm. uh, was available. Uh, I could come back and go to work and uh, just walk in like I just left. Mm -hmm. And so we just got right back in, found a place to live, and found out my wife was pregnant, mm -hmm. and so started our family. Yeah. All right. Now to look back at the time that you spent uh, kind of in and out of the service there uh, over the course of that, you know, half dozen years or whatever, uh, what effect do you think that had on you? Well, I guess I have a feeling of great respect for our people that are doing that for a living, if you will, and are spending 20 or 30 years doing this. Uh, you're there are people who don't have the joy of knowing that they're going to be here for a while. How many places do you live in, in, a, in a lifetime? The people in the military have probably have five, six times as many as mm -hmm. you and I might have had. Uh, so a great respect for this. I think it was... Uh, I found that there's a way there's a way to analyze things that's different than the way we did things. Uh, I don't know if I learned as much as I could have. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everybody's got 2020 hindsight. You know, you wish you had done something before. So there might have been a few more opportunities to do things or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Then you took. Okay. Uh, would you do it all over again? I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you've actually done a pretty good job here of telling us your story, so I'd like to close by thanking you for taking the time to do it. Well, thank you for taking the time to do this for the, all of our veterans here in the United States. All right. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.